Sydney is a city centred around a harbour and well known for the Opera House Harbour Bridge, New Year's Eve fireworks, beaches and that laid back lifestyle. G'day, my name is Catherine. I am a born and bred Sydney cider. Here are four great books set in my hometown. Book one is The Blue Mile by Kim Kelly. It's the 1930s and the Sydney Harbour Bridge is being built across the harbour. Two young people are at the start of their adult lives and they meet by chance. They are both smitten. Yo-Yo is a young Irish lad working a dangerous job high on the girders of the bridge. His job is to catch the rivets as the boilermakers attach each new section. Meanwhile, the ambitious and talented Olivia catches ferries under the bridge construction and across the harbour on her way to her fashion house in the city. They are from very different walks of life. Will they be able to bridge the class divide? More broadly, all of Sydney is caught up with bridge fever. Some even expect the bridge not to meet in the middle and fall down. This is a time of high unemployment and this well-researched story delves into the politics of the times. With the big fella, a prominent politician supporting the working class and the establishment supporting Mother England, literally causing rioting in the streets. I particularly enjoyed the author's description of real places in Sydney, like Olivia getting off the ferries at the quay and walking to work, Yo-Yo's Workman's Cottage in Balmain and the Lavender Bay area. But the shining light in the book for me is Yo-Yo's dedication to his younger sister Agnes and how hard he tries to escape an upbringing in poverty and violence. This book is for you if you like your characters with real world flaws. Book two is Puberty Blues by Kathy Lett and Gabriel Carey. This is a rite of passage saga set along the beaches in the south of Sydney. The story follows two teenagers, Debbie and Sue, as they try every trick in the book to be accepted by the coolest kids at school. Going to the beach is a big part of living in Sydney. Everyone has a favourite beach. Some like to go to popular spots and be seen. Others want to escape into the dunes and endless waves. Debbie and Sue will do anything and everything to be accepted, from perfecting how to blow the perfect smoke ring to fawning over the long-haired blonde surfies after they return to the beach from surfing the waves. But the question is, will Debbie and Sue achieve their dreams and be accepted, or will they be cast aside? I first read this book as a naive 15-year-old in the year it was published and loved the Aussie slang like, all he thinks of me is I'm a rootin' machine and I nearly spewed exaggerated characterizations of surfies, moles, nerds and mothers seem so real to me and the sex was a bit of a shock. Rereading the book 40 years on, it's a stroll down memory lane to a time when I lived at this beach and was fully immersed in beach culture from the clothes to the all year suntan. My favourite possessions were my Ben's bikini and boogie board. We went wave sailing at Wanda, bike riding in the dunes at Green Hills and I secretly preferred to swim in the flat water in the bay rather than get pummeled by the waves. When I first read this book and on the recent reread, I was horrified at how the girls submit themselves to conform to what others think is cool. Thankfully, Debbie and Sue do redeem themselves in my eyes in the last few pages. This book is a bit disjointed near the end and many will struggle with the Aussie slang. However, the unmasking of the complexity of beach life is masterful. This is one of the first books I've read that was uniquely Australian. Kylie Minogue, well-known Australian pop icon, summed up the book when she said, I don't recall reading Puberty Blues so much as devouring it. I was about 13, alone in my bedroom with the door firmly shut. I was fascinated. Book three is Watkin Trench 1788 by Tim Plannery. 
This is a first-hand account by a Marine officer called Watkin Trench of his experience in the early years of establishing a penal colony for the British on the shores of the harbour. Written over 200 years ago, Trench's humour, compassion and curiosity shine through. After eight months on a ship, Watkin had landed on the other side of the world. Kangaroos were just one of the strange spectacles that greeted the new arrivals. Everything was upside down and different and the heat was oppressive. He observes day-to-day -day life with a keen eye, including the strange colourful birds that squawked from the treetops, the hunger endured and the behaviour of the convicts. It was interesting to read about the original naming of places like Bellong Point, where the Opera House now stands. However, the big eye-opener for me was how he describes with candour his experiences with First Nations people, including the unlikely friendship of Governor Philip and Bennelong, a senior man of the Eora people, and the actions of Pemulay, who initially traded meat with the new arrivals and then ended up waging a guerrilla campaign against the colony. Whilst the content of the book is significant for Aussies, the book will appeal to anyone who enjoys a first-person accounts from a different time and place. Book four is the last painting of Sarah DeVos by Dominique Smith. Ellie, an art historian and former forger, is in Sydney to authenticate a 16th century masterpiece by a famous female Dutch painter. Ellie is working at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Each day, she walks to work and soaks up the beauty of the harbour and the gardens. The story weaves between the golden age of Dutch painting in the 1600s to New York in the 1950s and Sydney, the common thread being the painting by Sarah de Vos. Whilst all the story is not set in Sydney, the book still made it onto my list as it's a gem and a great way to authentically link our young city at just 180 years old to other times. The Sydney timeline coincides with the 2000 Olympics, a magical year for any Sydney cider. Throughout the story, we learn how the painting affects the creator, the owner and others in a great historical tale of love, grief, art and forgery. I particularly liked learning about how the art guilds worked in the golden age of Dutch painting. The question is, will Marty, the private investigator, uncover the truth about Ellie's forgery and what will he do? It's a clever and engrossing tale that transports you effortlessly between times and places. It's been great sharing these four books with you today. Links to all the books and extra content is in the description below. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future episodes. Upcoming episodes include Kyoto in Japan and Valletta in Malta. All of the past episodes can be accessed via this playlist. See you next time.